Hi folks. I guess if we're going to do a course on an introduction to computational thinking, we're going to have to sort of establish a baseline as to what is a computer. So, this video is going to give you a little introduction on what makes a computer a computer. Now, there's no hard and fast rules. Not everybody would agree with the exact same thing as the definition, but we'll come up with a working definition for us to use in this class, and we'll focus on the hardware that makes a computer a computer, and how that interfaces with things like the software. So, let's get going. Computer. We're going to start with a central processing unit, or CPU. This includes the, the controller, the brains that decide what's going to be done next, along with possibly some arithmetic logic units, uh, memory registers, and so on. Now, this is not a class that's going to teach you a lot of electrical engineering and how to build a computer and how to build an integrated circuit and things like that. Just be aware that a computer has a, a chip or a series of chips in it that take memory locations and do things with it. Add them, shift them right or left by a certain number of bits, do uh, ands, ors, uh, turn all the ones to zeros, all the zeros to ones, and so on. And by doing a bunch of these things in a row, we get all of the things we can do on a computer today. So, I mentioned memory. You can think of memory as a place that the central processing unit can get to where you store a bunch of zeros and ones. Okay. Now, part of this place is going to be, maybe it shows up partway through the memory, is going to be where the programs are stored that the central processing unit is going to be executing. And there's a very important concept called a program counter that points to the next instruction that needs to be executed. So the central processing unit will go over here and say, OK, I will pull in the next instruction. That instruction might be to, um, oh, let's see, to pick some data out of a specific point in memory, wherever that is. Maybe it's here or here or here. It's take this piece of memory and uh, add it to whatever is in this piece of memory and store it over here. Okay. Now, there are also peripheral devices associated with a central processing unit and the memory. There's some things that you want to do that the central processing unit can't get to directly. Maybe you want to read from your hard drive. Maybe you want to snap a picture with your camera. Maybe you want to know what mouse movement just happened. Maybe you want to send something to a printer. So you've got input and output devices that the central processing unit doesn't deal with directly. Instead, each of these input and output devices have a particular area in memory, maybe it's set aside right here, where they send their information. So the central processing unit may say, let's look at what the latest gesture was on the touch screen. And that information is available in memory that came from an input device. Or maybe it's a write this out to file xyz.txt, or send this to printer, or put this up on the display screen. And the, the hardware devices, the input or output devices, are mapped to an area of memory where they interpret, oh, this information means put this color of pixel in this place on the screen. Now, whenever the one instruction is done, the computer, the central processing unit, will advance the, uh, the program counter to the next location. So instead of pointing right here, it's going to move down to right here. Now, for the purposes of this class, what makes a computer a computer? We're going to insist that for us to call something a computer, it has some sort of control unit or central processing unit. It's not just a mechanical device like an abacus. Okay, it has to have memory. 
including a place for both data to be stored and for the programs that you're running to be stored. It has to have some method of getting input. That could be keyboard, mouse, touchscreen, scanner, camera, hard disk. The list goes on and on and on, and more things are added every day. It has to have some way to get output, uh, like a screen or a printer or speakers or a hard disk. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the central processing unit. This is the brains of the computer. It controls the program execution. And like we talked about when we were looking at the diagram, reads the instruction at the current program address. It executes the instruction. Now, this could be loading data from general memory to a special memory location called a register that's built right into the CPU and works really fast, or it could be moving information from a register into general memory, or performing some sort of arithmetic operation, or initiating an operation from some peripheral device. And then the brains of the computer updates the current program address. Now, what is memory? Specific sections of the electronic storage that can contain a number. It's ones and zeros, that's all it is. The location of a particular spot in memory is called the address. And memory is typically organized into bytes. We don't think of it as, here's this bit of memory, either a zero or one. Here's a zero or one, here's a zero or one. We chunk it together. And some of the units we use to chunk it together are called bytes. A byte is eight bits, eight zeros or ones. So, that means any one byte can store 256 different numbers. There are 256 different combinations you can make of eight positions, each of which has a zero or a one in it. Now, the data in memory can be interpreted as integers, numbers like 4 or 17 or 135 or negative 12. Or it could be interpreted as characters, the letter X. A capital letter X, this funny character that looks like a smiley face. It could be interpreted as floating point numbers. Uh, that's numbers that have a decimal point in it somewhere. The data in memory could be interpreted as addresses of other places of memory, it could be interpreted as colors, and so on. Often this data requires more than one byte to store. So uh, when we talk about uh, com computer programming, we're going to learn a little bit about how we name places in the memory so that we can use it efficiently because humans aren't real good at thinking about, you know, six gigabytes of zeros and ones. We need to name areas and know what they're going to be interpreted as. Now, input and output devices are interfaces between the computer and the external world. Now, that could be a human machine interface, such as a keyboard or a speaker or a stylus or a touchscreen, or it could be a machine-to-machine -machine interface, such as external storage devices, disk drives, DVDs, magnetic tape, that aren't meant for a human to read them directly, but we're saving it for later use as input by this computer 